Welcome to my introduction to technical ethics. I am using the book, Ethics and Technology, Controversial Questions and Strategies for Ethical Computing, ISBN number listed on the screen. My name is Arthur Salmon. I'm going to be working with you throughout this course. One of the important things to realize is I am using the PowerPoints from the publisher. They have all rights and privileges to that material. I'm not editing or modifying the PowerPoints in any way, so all credit goes to the publisher. Throughout this course, we're going to be dealing with a number of technical ethics based questions, and we're going to look at how we can actually answer or respond to those questions. I look forward to working with you throughout this course. Chapter 1 Introduction to Cyber Ethics. Here we're looking at the concepts, perspectives, and methodological frameworks. So, first of all, what is cyber ethics? Cyber ethics is the study of the moral, legal, and social issues involved in cyber technology. It is a, a field of applied ethics. It examines the impact that technology has on our social, legal, and moral structure and systems. Essentially, it evaluates the social policies and laws that we frame in response to issues generated by the development and the use of technology. I know this chapter keeps bringing up the concept of cyber technology, but it's in general technology, not just dedicated to cyber. So what is cyber technology? Cyber technology refers to a wide range of computing and communication devices, from the standalone computer to connect to a network, computing and communication technologies to the internet itself, cellular networks, smart devices, anything that connects and communicates to other devices are going to be part of this cyber technology. And in reality, that's pretty much all technology nowadays. Cyber technology includes digital electronic devices, networking devices, standalone devices, and so much more. Things like network devices can be connected directly to the internet. That's going to be things like Internet of Things, smart appliances, smart refrigerators, smart toasters, thermostats, door locks, so forth. As long as they can be connected to other devices through one or more private owned networks, they're going to be a cyber technology. Privately owned networks include things like a LAN, WAN, and so forth. Essentially any network will allow communication. So if the device connects to a network, it will communicate. It's cyber technology. So why the term cyber ethics? Cyber ethics is more accurately labeled than computer ethics or technology-based ethics, which can suggest the study of ethics related to either computing machines, professions. So cyber ethics is also more accurate than internet ethics, which is only limited to ethics issues affecting only network computers and devices. So cyber ethics is a combination or a hybrid of the two. So let's go and let's talk about the evolution of both cyber technology and cyber ethics. So here our book brings up four main phases. So basically computer tech emerged in the 40s when some of uh, analysts confidentially uh, predicted that no more than six computers would ever uh, need to be built. The first phase of computing technology actually were more of the 50s and 60s, and this is, consisted mainly of a huge mainframe that were unconnected. They were standalone. So one ethical social question that arose during this early phase was what impact would computing and computing machines, basically these giant brains, what did that mean for humans? And another question was raised during the same phase about privacy threats and the fear of Big Brother, meaning government oversight. 
So in phase two, that would be the 70s and 80s, computing machines and communication devices began to converge. They started communicating with one another. Mainframes actually allowed for the development of personal computers could be linked together uh, over private networks, which then generated three kinds of ethical social issues. Privacy concerns, again, that was already introduced in phase one, were kind of grown because confidential information could easily be exchanged between networked computers. The second issue was intellectual property issues. This emerged because personal computers could easily be duplicated and exchanged proprietary software programs early on. And three, computer crime emerged because hackers could break into these computers of the larger organizations and could steal information. So early on, hackers existed. The crime existed. Privacy and intellectual property issues existed. These aren't new issues. They've been around since the beginning. Phase three is essentially the 90s to the present. And that deals with the availability of internet access to the overall general public and how it increases. Both increases to individual access and speed of access. This has been facilitated by the phenomenal growth of the internet, the World Wide Web. So the pro proliferation of the internet and web-based technologies in this phase has raised its own ethical and social concerns. Free speech, anonymity, jurisdiction. Those are the big ones. Free speech, especially as we've grown to use social media, as we've grown to use the internet, free speech concerns have definitely just increased. So that was three of the four. Phase four is now to the future. Using things like the next generation web or web 2.0, using social connected applications or apps, mobile devices. All of these are part of this present and near future. So part of the new web has actually brought in social network sites. We're going to refer to these as SNSs, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, so forth, Snapchat. As technology continues to evolve, phase four will likely become more and more part of who we are, what we're doing. The understanding and the being of what it means to be human. Social media is actually redefining those structures, those constructs. So for example, more noted that computing devices will soon be part of our clothing, our bodies, our wearables. Computers are already becoming ubiquitous with the beginning of both our work and recreational environments. Most of us have smart watches. Most of us, because of current life events, work remotely, play remotely, go to school remotely. Technology has affected every way of our life. How we cook, how we pay bills, how we educate, how we entertain. Technology is involved in all of that, and almost every part of that also then ties into those social network sites. How many people have seen a smart refrigerator with the ability to access Facebook, or looking at new virtual uh, reality systems created by Facebook, new augmentation of VR, and it's, it's growing. Objects in these environments already uh, have a base level of intelligence calling them smart devices, or smart objects. You can now also have adaptive smart devices that learn patterns of their owners. We can have a thermostat that learns your pattern. It knows Monday through Friday at these times, do this action. They are learning our habits. With the development and the growth of AI, these smart devices, these smart objects, have only grown. 
So in phase four, computers are becoming less visible and distinct entities. They're continuing to get smaller. They're beginning to integrate into everything. They blend into our surroundings. So cyber technology is also becoming less distinguishable between other technologies as boundaries disappear. The convergence is starting to blur. Now, almost every smart device, every computing device we expect has a network component to it. No longer are we having standalone devices that operate individually. So additional ethics and social concerns associated with phase four will include controversial that are made possible by autonomous machines, sophisticated robots, self-driving cars, care for the elderly, adaptive learning devices, nanocomputing, nanoscale devices, smart devices that govern health, pacemakers that have an IoT component, artificial intelligence, artificial agents like softbots that can act on behalf of other entities, and of course AI, AI in bionic chips, in implants. Again, Pacemaker is a perfect example of this. So again, general overview, phase one, 50s and 60s, phase two, 70s and 80s, phase three, 90s to 2010, 2015, phase three, 2015 onward. Each having their own specific related ethical issues and social issues tied to that technology. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, why are cyber ethic issues unique to themselves? Why is ethical issues not just generalized? Well, cyber ethic issues are unique issues because they deal with very specific things. So example, review the mobile phone hacking incident part of scenario 1-1 in the textbook. Is there anything new or unique from an ethical point of view about the ethical issues that have emerged from this scenario? Again, the scenario was a discussion question inside the course. I'm assuming that you've done this portion inside the course shell. On the one hand, some high profile celebrities was harassed in ways that were not possible before the internet. But are there any new or any unique ethical issues generated in this scenario? Not really. Celebrities have to have a certain level of understanding that they are targeted. And well, realistically, we ha live in an internet era now. So there are additional ethical issues based off technology because of that. So there are two main points of views on whether cyber technology has generated any newer, unique ethical issues. Traditionalists argue that nothing is new. Crime is crime, murder is murder, rape is rape. Nothing is really new. Harassment is harassment. Uniqueness proponents argue that cyber technology has introduced some newer and unique ethical issues that could not have existed before computers. A common example that I use is Sexual assault is sexual assault. What happens if you are able to hack into an adult novelty item and you take it over? Is that not also then sexual assault? If the individual using that novelty item is not aware that you've taken it over and you have control of it, is that still not sexual assault? However, that may not have been the same construct prior to, well, those items having a internet connection. So, so again, I mean, there are unique issues because of the technology. So both sides seem correct for some of the claims, though they're not always correct on everything. Traditionalists underestimate the role and the scale and the scope that technology has had. 
Cyber bullies. Bullies are multiple victims simultaneous at large scale. You can now bully people globally. You can now bully people 24-7. As opposed to pre-internet, bullying kind of stopped existing when you left school. We left the bus. Now with social media, it's constant. So cyber bullies can also operate without ever having to leave the comfort of their home. They can stay at home and bully people. There takes very little effort for individuals to have to bully now. It's actually quite interesting because those that defend the uniqueness thesis overstate the effect that cyber technology has on ethics per se. Now, again, there are correct points out that computers are uniquely fast, uniquely uh, malleable, uniquely developing within our society. They allow additional constructs to be built off of them. So there are some unique aspects of technology. The proponents of the uniqueness theory tend to confuse unique features of the computer and the technology with unique ethical issues. Bullying, for example. While it may be easier to cyber bully someone, the underlining ethical issue of bullying is there regardless if you're dealing with bullying in person or bullying online. However, one may be easier than the other, and there's additional constructs there. Uh, online bullying can happen uh, more frequent. The underlying ethical issue of bullying is still there. So the argument is based on a logical fallacy. The, the premise is that cyber technology has some unique technology features. Cyber technology will generate some ethical issues. The conclusion, at least for some people, is the ethical issues generated by technology must be unique. Traditionalists and uniqueness advocate uh, are both partially correct. Traditionally, we'll point out that no, eth no new ethical issues have been introduced by computers. They just may have been adapted because of computers. The uniqueness proponents are correct in that cyber technology has complicated the analysis of those ethical issues because of the technical component. So in analyzing issues involving in this debate, it is useful to distinguish between any unique technology features, possible unique ethical issues as well. We have to actually separate those two key issues. So consider scenario one and two, or scenario one dash two and one dash three in the textbook. Again, the assumption is you've already gone through the scenario exercises in the course, so you know what those are. A computer professional is responsible for designing the software code for a controversial computer system. Ordinary users make unauthorized copies of the proprietary software. Are there any ethical issues that arise in either of the scenarios that are unique ethical issues? The stealing of software may be unique, however, the unauthorized access and copying of proprietary information is not new to computers. So Moore argues that computer technology will generate new possible uh, and possibilities for interactions because technology are logically malleable. That means logical malleability in computers mean that they can be molded in ways that allow for many different kinds of uses. So some of the unanticipated uses of computers have introduced policy vacuums. What is allowed online? What is allowed to be done with a computer? What are things not allowed? Our legal system sadly is outdated and it is really behind the times in terms of creating new regulations as it relates to technology. So let's look at the policy vacuum. So the policy vacuum are voids or uh, gaps in laws, policies, procedures, guidelines 
things of a legal nature. So one solution might seem simple to fill these voids with new or revised policies. Some policy vacuums can't easily be filled because of the con uh, conceptual muddles. So, what's really interesting, a good example here is duplication of home use of a VHS that was allowed. However, duplication of a DVD for home use is not allowed. One might be able to say, well, if I can duplicate a movie for home use, who cares what the medium is? Well, the, the media actually has different guidelines because of that. So in these cases, conceptual uh, models will first need to be allocated before clear policies can be formalized and justified. So what about the vacuum and duplicating software? In scenario 1-3, we looked at duplicating of the software. In the early 80s, there was no clear laws regarding the duplication of software programs because the court system wasn't, wasn't there yet. Because there were no clear rules for copying programs, that's where the policy vacuum actually arose. So before the policy could actually be filled, a conceptual model had to be uh, lubricated. What exactly is what software? How do we define software? We have to have a working definition before we can actually work on it. So let's look at cyber ethics as a branch of applied ethics. Because we've been looking at cyber ethics, but that is a subsection of applied ethics. Applied ethics, unlike theoretical ethics, examines the practical ethical issue, the applied portion. It analyzes moral issues from the vantage point of one or more ethical theories. Ethicists work in fields of applied ethics and are more interested in applying ethical theories to the analysis of specific moral problems and ethical problems rather than debating the ethical theories themselves. They actually have, know the ethical theories and they're trying to apply them, the practicality of them, the implementation of them. There are three distinct perspectives on applied theories as they apply to cyber ethics, professional ethics, philosophical ethics, and sociological and descriptive ethics. So let's go ahead and look at perspective number one, cyber ethics as a branch of prof uh, professional ethics. According to this view, the purpose of ethics is identify and analyze issues of ethical responsibility for the professional in technology. Consider a computer professional role in designing, developing, maintaining ha hardware, software, and the actual systems. Suppose a programmer discovers that a software has a, uh, a bug before the release of a cell to the public. Even though it's unreliable because of it having a bug, what should they do? Should they blow the whistle? It also depends on what role they're playing in that. If they're, again, a professional, if they're the, the programmer, how does that actually equate to the sale of that product? Would management be okay? Again, there's more issues there than should they blow the whistle. It's not as straightforward as that. So professional ethics basically suggests that computer ethics are professional ethical issues. Though computer ethics for uh, him is similar to medical ethics and legal ethics, which are tied to issues involving their specific professions. A doctor has ethical dilemmas that only a doctor would face. A lawyer has ethical dilemmas that only someone that practiced law will actually have to deal with. They note that computer ethics aren't really strictly speaking about technology. For example, they don't have automobile ethics or airplane ethics, even though automobiles and airplanes are both technology-based technology. Well, they're items based off of technology. But there aren't professionals like auto mechanic ethics or airplane mechanic ethics. 
though one could argue that the profession mechanic might have specific ethical issues dealing with their specific field, automobile, uh, automobile versus airplane. So some critics of the professional ethics perspective is, ethics are too narrow for cyber ethics. Considering that cyber ethic issues affect not only computer professions, they affect everyone using technology. So before the widespread use of the internet, professional ethic model was okay. But because of the internet, not okay anymore. So perspective number two, philosophical ethics. From this perspective, cyber ethics is a field of philosophical analysis and inquiry that goes beyond professional ethics. Basically here, Moore defines computer ethics in the realm of philosophical ethics as the analysis of the nature and social impact of technology and the corresponding formulation and justification of policies for the ethical use of such technology. So Moore argues that the automobile and airplane technologies did not affect our social policies and norms in the same way fundamentally that computers have. So things like automobile and airplane technologies have re uh, revolutionized transportation and resulting in the ability to travel faster and further than in other areas. But they're not the same impact on our legal and moral system that technology would be. So looking at ethical standards of applied ethics, Bray describes the standard methodology used by philosophers in applied ethics having a few different stages identify, describe and analyze, and apply moral theories and principles to reach a position. So now let's go and look at perspective number three. Cyber ethics as a field of sociological and descriptive ethics. Professional and philosophical perspectives both illustrate normativity inquiries into applied ethics. Basically meaning normative inquiries or studies are contrasted with descriptive studies. A descriptive or sociological studies investigate or report what is the case, not so much why, but what are we looking at. So normative inquiries will evaluate situations from the vantage point of the question, what ought to be the case? not what is the case. So again, looking at scenario 1-4 in the, in the textbook, suppose that a technology displaces workers. Should we develop it? In this example, we could be looking at the auto industry, robots making cars. It displaced all of the auto workers. Was this technology worth it? We can now make cars faster, safer, but those jobs are now lost. So what do we do? So if we analyze the issue solely on the term of their sociological dimension, including the number of jobs that were gained or lost, that would be essential to descriptive ethics. They're descriptive in nature. So essentially, when we're understanding the descriptive aspect of the social effects of technology, the normative ethics issues become clearer. The descriptive sociological perspective can prepare us for our subset analysis of the ethical issues that affect our systems, policies, and laws. It all depends on how we're trying to look at this, and that's the issue. If we're looking at a concern with a very specific lens, we can define it based off of that lens. That doesn't mean that's how it affects everything. So again, types of perspectives, professional, philosophical, sociological, or descriptive. How we actually associate the different disciplines, professional like computer science or engineering, where philosophical is a more law, so if we're talking sociological or descriptive, that's going to be sociology or behavioral science. And we can look at cyber ethics different 
perspectives based off of the perspective of professional, philosophical, or sociological, or descriptive. Multiple ways of looking at this. That's the issue. That's why we have to look at what cyber ethics is. So how do we disclose the method of cyber ethics? Bray believed that we have to look at cyber technology as the basis because it's embedded. So the standard applied ethical methodology is not adequate for identifying cyber ethical issues. For example, Bray noted that we might fall for notice certain features embedded in the design of cyber technology. Using the standard model, we might also fail to recognize that certain practices involve technology that might also have moral implications. He also points out one weakness of the standard method of applied ethics is that it tends to know on what's known moral controversies. So this has to be a known issue. So a model fails to identify practice involving cyber technology which have moral implications that are not known. So the unknown portion could actually slip through. So Bray will refer to these practices as having moral opaqueness or moral non-transparency features. Basically means moral transparency features and you can compare and contrast the two. So transparent feature can be uh, either actual transparent or non-transparent. If we're looking at the moral opaque features, we can define them as known or unknown. Known features were aware of. Unknown features were not aware of. So unknown features could be like data mining based off of our cookies, where known features might be data analytics used off of our web searches. We may not give specific permission to data mine us, but we know that when we do web searches, that's being tracked. So Bray's uh, disclosive method is multidisciplinary because it requires the collaboration of different professionals, cyber uh, specialists, uh, computer science, philosophers, social scientists, and more. So the scheme is a multi-level because of the methods of conducting the ethical research and it does require three levels of analysis. Disclosure level, theoretical level, and application level. So again, if we can look at the multiple levels, looking at the disciplines involved, and we can then define our tasks. So lastly, is a three-step strategy for approaching ethical issues that are more cyber ethic identified. Step one, identify a practice involving cyber or technology or a feature in that technology that is controversial form of a moral perspective. Step two, analyze that issue by clarifying the concept and the situation in the appropriate context. Context matters here. Deliberate on the ethical issue. The deliberation process requires two main stages. And the stages are apply and justify. So if we're looking at the identified step one, you should be able to disclose any hidden data or opaque features. If there are ethical issues that are descriptive, assess the appropriate implications. If there are ethical issues that are normative, determine whether there are any specific guidelines for that group, or the professional codes, things of that nature. If there are normal ethical issues remain, we can go to step two, the analyze portion. And part of the analyze portion is going to be that policy vacuum. Clear up any of the conceptual models that are involved in this and then go to the deliberate. And again, deliberate was apply the appropriate ethical theories and justify the position by evaluating it against the rules for logical critical thinking. And that we're going to deal with in chapter three. That concludes the end of this lesson. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to me. Remember that as we go through this material, we're gonna have concepts that may not be the most straightforward. Reach out, I can always help clarify things as long as you're willing to, to communicate with me. 
I look forward to working with you throughout this semester. Thank you.